So now that we have covered the three branches of government in a lot of detail, we really need to move into the early history of the United States knowing the facts that we know now. Some of the facts that we've learned in a lot of detail these first few units would really make the story of the Federalist era a little confusing without knowing those things. So the first few units you may have felt like a lot of factual information is just being thrown at you. But this should really bring a lot of that together in a narrative story format that you're used to in history. So to get started with the Federalist era, you must review a little bit the unwritten Constitution. We've already discussed this a little. Washington establishes an immediate policy of neutrality. He also establishes the presidential cabinet. The debates within Washington's first cabinet lead to the formation of the first political parties. And when Washington finishes up his second term in office, he refuses a third term, which establishes a tradition of a two-term limit. All of these things are centered around George Washington. None of them are written in the Constitution, but nonetheless, all of them take place. Washington refuses to establish outright alliances with any foreign countries. He prefers to allow his presidential cabinet to debate before he makes a decision. He thinks that will allow him to make extremely informed decisions. The two people who butted heads the most in his presidential cabinet were Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, as well as Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton. And the last tradition would be refusing a third term, and this was merely a tradition until 1952 when a constitutional amendment officially said that you could not serve more than two terms. The cabinet, all the way to the left, George Washington, along with him, Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of the Treasury, Edmund Randolph, Attorney General, Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of State, and Henry Knox, Secretary of War. This small cabinet of four advisors, and often John Adams, the vice president, would sit in on cabinet meetings as well. They argued back and forth quite a bit, and Washington believed that this would allow him to hear all of the opinions that are probably also felt by the common public before making decisions on certain issues. So the formation of political parties coming out of Washington's cabinet is really based around Hamilton's financial plan. This is hands down the biggest issue in Washington's presidency. Washington trusted Hamilton to get the economy going, have people making plenty of money, making good livings, and that this would bring stability to a really young nation. Opponents, like Thomas Jefferson, saw it as an abuse of power. But the financial plan, the basics of it, is that it was supposed to be a way to repay national and state debts. The backbone of it was a national bank where tax revenues could be deposited but also loans could be given out to new businesses and lastly tariffs to protect American industries from foreign competition. Now if you remember back to the Constitutional Convention, tariffs were debated there. Import tariffs were often very high, whereas export tariffs were non-existent. This was so that southern cash crops would not be taxed before leaving the country, but that foreign goods would be taxed before coming in. That way, American products would be more attractive to the consumer than foreign products. This is obviously a major topic of debate when it's got such a divided two sides to it. It's really Hamilton versus Jefferson here. Now, the Federalists, remember, root here is federal. These people believe in strong federal government. Now, the leader of this movement is really Hamilton. He is the most significant Federalist during Washington's presidency. He and the Federalist Party claim that the Constitution allows for policies like Hamilton's financial plan through the Necessary and Proper Clause. That is the language from the Constitution. It is better known as its nickname, the Elastic Clause. This is found in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. Using the Elastic Clause to allow for an expansion of federal power is called loose construction. Federalists supported Hamilton's plan because that they thought it would provide strength and stability to the federal government. This was the biggest reason Washington supported this policy. A stable nation would mean economic growth because people would not be worried about their investments. A national bank would provide loans to new businesses and again spur economic growth. And lastly, tariffs would promote U.S. businesses against European competitors. 
This would also spur economic growth. So if you look at all three goals, the big goal of the Federalists, economic growth, economic growth, economic growth. The Federalists are focused entirely around the economic growth of the nation. Now, the Democratic Republicans, which are the opposition party to the Federalists and Alexander Hamilton, are led by Thomas Jefferson. Democratic Republicans' priority, as opposed to the Federalists, is states' rights. Folks that belong to the Democratic Republican Party would believe much more in state government having more power than the federal government, especially given the Ninth and Tenth Amendments that said non-enumerated powers would be for the states or the people themselves, not the federal government. They believed the plan was unconstitutional and that the Elastic Clause was not meant for this purpose. And they argued against the plan because the assumption of all state debts under the National Bank Plan would only benefit states who had accumulated mass amounts of debt. So therefore, states that had been fiscally responsible would be helping pay for the debts of states who had been fiscally irresponsible. Further, they said a national bank would only benefit northern merchants who needed startup money for businesses, and that southern farmers would more or less be left out of the loop. So this is the big argument of the Democratic Republicans led by Jefferson. Now, early actions of the government under Washington as president. The Whiskey Rebellion is a significant moment. This moment is at the beginning of George Washington's second term as president. It is an excise tax on whiskey that causes whiskey producers in western Pennsylvania to really stand up violently to protest the tax. Washington responds by sending federal troops to put down the rebellion. Now the scale of how many federal troops were sent was astronomical, but Washington did it for a reason. He wanted to send the message that rising up against the United States government would be met with massive force, and he wanted this to prevent any future rebellions from taking place. If you remember, Shays Rebellion is what made people nervous about the Articles of Confederation not being able to survive. Therefore, they wrote the Constitution. This Whiskey Rebellion would have scared people just as much had Washington not put down the rebellion with massive force. This painting is Washington issuing orders to the military to end the rebellion. And you can see the large number of troops that are being used and cannons. This was meant to be an overwhelming response that would send the message that rebellion would not be tolerated. At the end of the Federalist era, John Adams, who was Washington's vice president, becomes president. The competition between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans reaches ahead in the late 1790s. John Adams and the Federalists, trying to maintain power over the government, issue the Alien and Sedition Acts. The Alien Act said that the president could deport foreigners who considered a danger to public safety. And the Sedition Act said that the government can fine and or imprison newspaper editors who write or publish any scandalous and malicious articles against the government. This should sound familiar. The John Peter Zanger libel case of 1733, which was the foundation for the First Amendment, was very much the same thing. Now, Virginia and Kentucky both pass resolutions at the state level claiming the right to nullify, which is to disregard, the acts as unconstitutional, which they meant a violation of the Bill of Rights. The result is that when President John Adams and the Federalist majority in Congress continue to support the laws despite the popular opposition of the people against them, they lost a lot of support. The election of 1800 is actually known as the Revolution of 1800, and not because there was any violence, but because the Democratic Republicans resoundingly took control of the government because the Federalists were seen as abusing their power. The people who went to the polls stopped supporting the Federalists and swung their support in favor of the Democratic Republicans. 
There is, however, a disputed election of 1800, not because of close competition between the Democratic Republicans and the Federalists, because John Adams was running for re-election and didn't even come anywhere near close the tie vote of 73 to 73, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. Both of these candidates are Democratic Republicans, so it shows that both people being from the same party means that the public is overwhelmingly supporting a change from what they saw as abuses of power from the Federalist Party. Now, what happens in a tie vote? It goes to the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives voted to support Thomas Jefferson, and the Twelfth Amendment is passed in 1804 to prevent any future tie votes in the Electoral College. This is the end of the Federalist Era presentation. Please make sure that you go to the website and take the online quiz. Use your notes so that you do very well. And I will see you in class.